So welcome everyone to our first event of the year, a very warm well welcome. And today we'll be discussing uh, what the future looks like for the tourism industry. Uh, we've got some great set, uh, speakers from across the sector uh, with us today. Um, and they cover hospitality attractions, uh, culture, and it, they'll give an update on uh, their own, from their own point of view. And then we'll have a question and answer session. And then we'll finish off with a, an update on our Marketing Manchester's recovery campaigns. So I hope that sounds appealing. Uh, many of you have joined us. I think that's all that pent up um, interest after the new year in, in this sector. So please do add any questions to the chat box throughout the session. We'll try and pick them up. Um, but just to kick off uh, before I hand over to speakers, I thought it'd be helpful just to give a very quick summary of the challenges and opportunities that this sector faces. So we all know the impact of COVID has hit us hard and very early. Uh, inbound business visits and events right across the industry, hospitality, attractions, culture have all been impacted. Uh, and that really has exposed uh, perhaps some shortcomings uh, to structural shortcomings to the tourism sector, as well as the vulnerability of that uh, to external shocks like COVID. Um, just looking at some of the fig figures from the Office of uh, National Statistics, and they reported that accommodation and food sector alone was 67% down year on year. In uh, and that was also um, felt in terms of the arts and entertainment sector being 37% down. And that perhaps reflects in terms of the knock on impact, the wider impact of tourism across other sectors. Um, and the very interlinked nature of tourism. We also know Brexit is uh, upon us, presents many challenges, and that's challenges we're going to have to deal with this year, ranging from you know the, the reassurance we need to give to those um, European visitors in terms of visas and passports, access to uh, the labour market, and also just plain and simple tax-free shopping. So many challenges there. However, I um, do feel that there's opportunities now for the sector going forward. And I think this is an opportunity like any crisis or challenge has an opportunity to move forward to more, perhaps more of a resilient, um, sustainable model of for our, our sector, hopefully a greener and fairer sector and um, returning to obviously a prosperous and thriving sector too. Uh, so it was great to hear yesterday the tourism minister speaking to the nine mayors across the country um, and saying it's quite optimistic, actually, saying that they um, optimistic about the bounce back, optimistic about a, a, the pent up demand, uh, saying firstly that the tourism sector deal that they described last year was not fit for purpose anymore, but they're working uh, on a current tourism recovery plan. Um, and also to say that really positively that expecting a strong bounce back to uh, to occur because of the uh, pent up demand. So perhaps on that positive note, I'm going to hand over to to Nick, Nick Brooks Sykes, our fabulous tourism director, who will speakers and facilitate the Q and A session. Over to you, Nick. Thanks, Shona. Um, it's a while since I've been called fabulous, so it's nice. It's nice to have that um, that name. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted, really, to host the next part of um, our webinar this afternoon, and to introduce um, uh, a panel of friends, really, uh, both friends personally to me, but also friends to Manchester. And um, um, we've got some um, some great conversations to have with them this afternoon. So let me just start by introducing our panel for for the next part of this session. Uh, firstly, uh, Kate Nichols is the chief executive officer at UK Hospitality. Um, she knows no. She needs no introduction, I'm sure, to, to many of us on this call this afternoon. Uh, she's lobbied. Um relentlessly uh, over the last um, nine, ten months um, for the sector and, and been at um, government table uh, uh, more often than at her breakfast table, I'm sure, in terms of having uh, conversations with ministers and putting on, um, putting them very squarely in, in, um, in the picture as to what's going on on the ground. Um, second, we've got Bernard Donoghue. Uh, Don, uh, Bernard's uh, the ex-chair of uh, visit Manchester, so um, knows Manchester very well. Um, also um, sits on the panel, uh, the trustees of the People's History Museum. So uh, again, knows Manchester really well. Um, he's currently the director of ALVA, the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions. 
um, having previously worked at Visit Britain. And then, uh, uh, no stranger to any of us, Dave Mutri, our own uh, Director of uh, Culture for Manchester City Council, but also the Chief Executive of HOME, um, um, the highly successful um, arts complex um, in, um, in Manchester, having moved from the corner house and been involved in the city's cultural life for as long as I've been involved in tourism, Dave. So a, a long time now uh, between us, really. So welcome all three of you this afternoon. Um, really, the brief for each of you was the same, and um, we're going to get um, a different set of opinions or maybe similar opinions from, from each of you over the next 30 minutes. Um, and we've asked um, each of our panelists to um, a, a series of questions um, to set out um, what their views are of the current state of the sector, um, what government's response has been so far and their view of that? What more needs to be done? And where are we heading to in the future and the challenges that we face? So um, a big set of questions for each um, of you to answer in, in, in a tiny amount of time. We've allocated 10 minutes to each of you to answer those, those sets of questions, really. But I think that the main thing is really to give a sense of where we are now and where we might be um, going forward and what we still need to, to challenge government with or to, to, to lobby government for or what we need to do ourselves in terms of the roadmap going forward. So uh, without further ado, um, uh, I'm going to start with Kate and then come to Bernard and then uh, finish more locally with Dave. So Kate, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And thank you for having me here today at this webinar. Uh, it's really good to be back talking at Manchester and, and then being part of the sort of plans for the recovery, trying to keep that optimistic note going. And I'll try and be as optimistic as I possibly can uh, in the next 10 minutes. There's an awful lot to unpack, um, but I'm going to do my very best to cover all of the issues that you tasked me with covering in the space of 10 minutes. So marks get set, go. I'm going to start on the optimistic point, which is where did we start 2020? And actually, this is a year, almost a year to the day since um, Bernard and I first started talking to government about COVID. My first meeting on COVID was the 21st of January, and I've been nonstop ever since that trying to make sure. But I think the fact that tourism and hospitality went in early, went in hard, stood us in really good stead because before anybody else had woken up to the tsunami that was going to hit us in the course of 2020, we were there as the canary in the coal mine saying, this is big, this is serious, you need to get it sorted and you need the support mechanisms in place. Which is why I think that the ministers have kept hospitality and tourism to the forefront. So where did we start 2020? On a really high note, growing 5% year on year and generating one in six of net new jobs and investing 10 billion pounds in the high street. So 130 billion pound industry, bigger than aerospace, automotive and pharmaceuticals put together. Third largest export earner. People spend more, foreign tourists spend more on eating and drinking out in the UK than all of our food and drink exports put together. 3.2 million people employed directly in the sector and 1.5 million in the supply chain. Huge employer, third largest private sector employer, 11% of employment, 7% of GDP, and 40 billion pounds worth of tax generated for the exchequer. Um, now that is the entire social care budget or the entire Brexit divorce bill, whichever one you wanna choose. Um, I, I, so that was the positive. And the reason I want to start with the positive is that's where I also want to end up as our future and our optimism and where we're going forward for, for cities like Manchester. Where we are at the moment is probably at our lowest ebb. This is the Nadia. So we've just done those stats again. The turnover down 74 billion pounds wiped off the value of hospitality and tourism, almost all of the international tourism money coming in. Uh, so third largest export earner totally wiped out or almost obliterated. Our revenues more than halved. We lost 200 million pounds a day, eight pounds every hour. Um, that we were closed or restricted during 2020. Sadly, 28% drop in our headcount, 660,000 fewer jobs, and many more potentially to come as furlough unwinds unless the government gets the exit strategy right. Um, particularly in places like Manchester where businesses have been in restrictions for so much longer. I mean, you've got almost the best part of uh, eight to 10 months that you've been in restrictions already and still three to four months to go if you believe what you read in the Telegraph this morning. So a very bleak picture. 
uh, of where we are. And uh, no surprise that with a cash burn of half a billion pounds a month to keep hospitality closed, one in five of our businesses say they do not have enough cash reserves to get through to March. So what do we need to do about it? How do we need to get the, the government to give more support? Because I think it's, you'll be fair to say that the, the, the focus on hospitality and tourism has been unprecedented, has been sustained. There have been contributions. It's not enough. It's never enough, but you can't deny there has been support. So three point plan of where we need to go next and what we need to do next to get back to recovery. First of all, a clear staged exit strategy, not just for coming out of lockdown, but coming out of restrictions, because the restrictions that we opened up with, those of us fortunate to open up in July, the restrictions that we opened up with then to make us COVID secure meant that we were never going to be profitable. So they are not sustainable to keep in for any length of time. If you've got attractions, if you've got hotels, if you've got restaurants and pubs, that can only operate at 50 to 60 percent of capacity because of social distancing have to employ extra members of staff to manage social distancing and move people around as well as the the investment that was made in covid secure protocols the best our businesses were able to achieve in two weeks one at the end of august one at the beginning of september was to break even so longer term we need to come out of lockdown we need to move in a phased way through a, a phased reopening and that needs to be speedy for the sake of the economy and for the sake of those businesses who cannot hold on beyond march and then we need a clear exit strategy that removes those restrictions altogether if you link it to the vaccine you should be able to time limit it and you should be able to give businesses that staged approach that allows them to plan the uncertainty at the moment undermines investment it undermines mental health and well-being. It means that we are unable to give reassurances to our teams, and that's not good enough as far as I'm concerned. We need to end that uncertainty as, as fast as we can. And we also need to ease the restrictions that we've got in place in terms of foreign travel, foreign tourism, uh, to make sure that we can restart international tourism. Places like Manchester heavily dependent upon international business travel, international tourism. We need to make sure that we can look at a phased approach to reopening that as well. Uh, and moving off some of those restrictions. So very pleased to hear the Prime Minister yesterday say he will come back to the House of Commons with a clear exit strategy on the 22nd of February, based on an update as to where we are in vaccine rollout on the 15th of February, and that that will start to happen and we'll peel that back from the 8th of March. We need to have clear phases, we need to know what's coming back, and we link it to the vaccine rollout, should, be allowed, should allow us to be able to say when we can take those restrictions off, uh, and build the resilience back in and rapid testing. Critical that we get rapid testing rolled out so that we can restart events, conferences, bigger scale events, and particularly the nighttime economy, so vital to the economic success of Manchester. Second point is about rebuilding shattered balance sheets, tackling the indebtedness and allowing businesses to recover in hospitality and generate the economic recovery. Um, we survived the black swan, or most of us did. We now need to survive the grey rhinoceros, which is going to run alongside us for a lot longer to come and could yet run, run many businesses off the road. We need that continued support through the recovery period, through the reopening period, and for long enough to allow a, a rebuild of balance sheets. Uh, we talked about the, the possibility of a, a rapid bounce back, the tourism minister being confident that we can bounce back quickly. Those two things will hit us if we can't. You know, the fact that you've got businesses that are at very low resilience in hospitality and tourism, if you don't have those businesses surviving in the short term, you're not gonna bounce back quickly. The best way for the government to get rapid recovery, to get growth and investment spread throughout the country and to, to deliver its leveling up agenda is to back tourism and hospitality because we can recover the quickest. If you lift restrictions one day, people will come out the next and on the third day, we will create a new job. So back us and you need to do that through the, the budget on the 3rd of March. We need the low rate of VAT retained for tourism and hospitality in order to help rebuild confidence. It's gonna take us much longer to get consumer confidence going again, particularly for those events and activities that need a longer booking time and particularly for hotels. People have been messed around too much and we need the business rates holiday extended if we are to go back to being able to invest in the high street and help towns and city centers recover. And it's gonna be critical for cities like Manchester. And then the third one is an exit strategy from the rent moratorium and a, a route map so that we can tackle rent debt, because that, again, is going to cripple many town and city centre businesses. And then third point about it, what we need the government to do, talk about that tourism sector deal, that tourism recovery map. 
We need to look at structural reform, long-term reform of business rates to make it fit for the 21st century, long-term reform of business taxation, Landlord and Tenant Act, planning and licensing. If we get those things right, as well as the career aspirations, the, tra the training, uh, the T levels, the qualifications, then we can go back to doing what we do best, which is where I started my little talk. We can go back to growing 5% year on year, the only sector of the economy in growth. We can go back to delivering one in six of net new jobs, and we can invest in our high streets, town centers, and we can be a literal showcase for global Britain, hosting the G7 in Cornwall, hosting COP26 in Glasgow, working alongside the government with its D20 agenda. But to do that, they need hospitality to be at full strength. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. That's um, that's packed 10 minutes of th thorough thought. So thanks for that. Can I just put you on the spot? When, when do you think we're going to be able to reopen then? <laughs> oh gosh, uh, that's a difficult one. It, I, I don't have the data on vaccines, nor do I have the data on our numbers. Um, I think March is out. Is this is this is just my my guess? March is out. Uh, there was talk about May. Um, I, I think that might be uh, longer than, than than they might look at. Fifty fifty, we could be open at Easter weekend. Okay. I don't think that's all of the sector. I think that's probably parts. Okay, thank you. That's a good start. Um, right. Um, if you've got questions, put them in the chat box, people, and uh, we'll try and get to those after we've had um, the presentations from all three of our speakers. So without further ado, over to you, Bernard. Thanks very much, Nick. <clears throat> thank you for the invitation to come on uh, today. It's, it's lovely to be virtually back in Manchester. Um, I suppose my quick points are, number one, everything that Kate said. Um, and th that's that's genuinely not an accident. Um, one of the things that has been absolutely fantastic this year is how all of the diverse elements of our visitor economy have shared the same script, shared the same data, asked for the same things. And I'm absolutely of the view that our coherence and our common agenda has made all the difference in talking to government ministers and winning the significant amounts of both policy and financial support that we have. Uh, I suppose the second point is um, data and intelligence and insights. These are not sexy words, but I know that when I was chairing Visit Manchester, actually we wouldn't have got anywhere with Visit Manchester and Marketing Manchester's members, we're talking to the City Council, we're talking to all of the boroughs. If we didn't have really good evidence and data about how big the Manchester visitor economy was, how important it was culturally, socially, economically, and in terms of well-being. So uh, having data about the economic impact of the last year is crucial to arm ourselves to have more assertive and better and more productive conversations with ministers. Um, in terms of, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go from hindsight to foresight. And my hindsight is, is an optimistic one. Um, and it comes back to the very origins of the Tourism Alliance. The Tourism Alliance was created 20 years ago next month. And the reason being is that on the 19th of February, 20 years ago, it was the first case of foot and mouth disease in the UK. First case of foot and mouth disease since 1967. And as you know, I mean, all four of us were kind of around at the time. Uh, it decimated the agricultural industry and the farming industry, but it decimated tourism more. And the UK lost eight billion pounds that year in lost revenues, the vast majority coming from tourism, hospitality and attractions. Are Inbound visitors numbers went off a cliff, our domestic visitor numbers went off a cliff, and it took us a lot of time and a lot of government support to recover well and recover better. 20 years on, it's a different scenario, but we can learn lots of lessons. So 20 years ago, we, we created the Tourism Alliance in order to have a coherent voice to speak to local authorities, regional government, and central government, uh, and that's proved to be very, very successful. But we were also very, very clear in what we wanted of government to repair our balance sheets, to boost consumer confidence. So they felt able then and they will feel able now to come back to our bars and restaurants, our hotels and visitor attractions. So I think our asks of government 
based on that uh, are relatively straightforward and and from my point of view kind of inarguable the first is that we have only as a sector been able to benefit from one bank holiday in the whole of the last year now that means that we haven't had the opportunity to really repair our balance sheets and have a, a real opportunity to launch ourselves again uh, as an economically viable sector Therefore, we absolutely need to open for the Easter weekend in order to revitalise the, the traditional start of the UK tourism industry. Second, uh, attractions absolutely need to reopen at the same time as non-essential retail. Uh, we've absolutely proved in the attraction sector, thanks to the diligence of Public Health England's data, that there hasn't been any... Uh, transmission, any case of transmission of coronavirus at a visitor attraction in the UK over the last year, not from staff to visitor or visitor to visitor or visitor to staff, or such that they're statistically negligible. So we proved that attractions are COVID safe thanks to the really hard work and diligence of front of house staff, training, ops, cleaning, security, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was madness that when the Trafford Centre reopened, the only three stores in the Trafford Centre that couldn't reopen were visitor attractions, like the Legoland Discovery Centre. Frankly, if you can open H&M, you can open the V&A. If you can open H&M, you can open Mosey. Uh, it, 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 it's just as easy as that. So we want to have visitor attractions on the same playing field as the rest of the non-essential retail sector. And therefore, Kate's points about VAT and business rates extending those really crucial fiscal supports are absolutely uh, absolutely crucial um the reduced rate of vat which many of us have been working on to get for years and years and years we used to have the second highest rate of vat on accommodation and attractions in europe that reduction down from 20 percent to five percent has been crucial in kick-starting uh, visitor attractions hospitality and accommodation to try and get back some of their cash and to repair their balance sheets but frankly, we haven't been open long enough to really benefit from it. And we're due at the moment for that 5% to go back up to 20% on the 1st of April. Now, that's significant because the 1st of April is the day before Good Friday. It's the day before the start of Easter. We do not want to be in a position where um, one of our most important industries is putting their prices up 15% on the day before Easter start. That's crazy it's bad pr for the government as well but it's also economically disastrous for our sector and from a, a cultural and visitor attractions point of view what have we learned this year that can make us optimistic uh, well the first is that when visitor attractions were open were able to reopen people flocked back they flocked back to reduce capacity but they flocked back why? Because visitor attractions, museums and galleries, places like John Ryland's and the Imperial War Museum North, uh, Manchester Art Gallery the, um, and uh, People's History Museum, of which I'm a trustee, these are genuinely important places for people. They're culturally important, they're economically important, they're socially important. But they're also, and forgive me for getting a bit romantic about this, they're also the backdrops for people's happiest memories. They're good for mental health and well-being. And we know that people have responded to the reopening of visitor attractions really, really positively. And it's meant that we have to do things in different ways. I think we need to recover better. It would be wrong if the cultural sector just reopened their doors to exactly the same kind of people that they closed them to last March. That means we've learned nothing. I think the confluence of COVID and Black Lives Matters has challenged all of us to tell stories about who we are, where we come from and what we value in different, authentic and critically honest ways. And I think, frankly, that's a particular challenge to the original modern city of Manchester about being creative in that storytelling. Um, and then I think... Um, one of the last is that we've seen an explosion of creativity in the, in the cultural and attraction sector. That whilst many of our attractions and, and cultural buildings and cultural organisations have been physically closed, they've been digitally open. 
They've been virtually open 24 hours a day to the world. And we've seen an explosion of creativity in exciting and enticing and telling the stories of their people and places and collections in really new and innovative ways. And that's often meant that new audiences are coming through the door because they feel confident to do so because they've snacked the attraction online. Uh, and that's brilliant. That's brilliant because it gives us a fresh and new mandate to recover better, to recover well. And, and coming back to my really optimistic point, you know, we provide the backdrops for people's happiest memories in our sector. Uh, this is not only where you grow jobs in tourism and hospitality and culture, it's where you grow people. It's where you grow them in terms of their intellectual curiosity or their sense of citizenship or their sense of place in the world. And indeed, what Manchester was, what it is now and what it will be in the future. So I'm inherently optimistic as I was 20 years ago when tourism was hit by a devastating uh, impact. It showed our vulnerability, but it also proved and showed our resilience and vibrancy too. Um, so that's why I'm positive about the recovery that we can make. It will take a long time. It will be slow. There will be casualties along the way, but I'm confident of the resilience that we can show and our strength of purpose in doing that. Thanks, Nick. Bernard, thank you. Thank you very much. That's that's excellent um, synopsis of what what what, um, what you think the world looks like from from Alva's point of view. Um, quick question to you. Um, Evidence of pent up demands. Do you see that in the visitor attractions sector? Is there any insights that you can share about people waiting to get out there and visit things? Yes, um, the evidence of last year and some of the evidence that we researched that we commissioned here at Alva. So as soon as outdoor attractions were able to open, they were swamped, but in a COVID safe way. Uh, there was real, real desire to go back to pl places and to share experiences with family and friends in a COVID safe way. Uh, and I think that will exactly happen again. One of the most extraordinary and quite touching things has been membership retention levels. So if you've been a member of People's History Museum or MOSI or the National Trust, actually people have been taking out memberships under lockdown when they physically can't go to places, but as an expression of their financial and emotional support for our cultural sector. So that, that, that membership retention has been extraordinary and brilliant. So too have personal donations and people responding to fundraising appeals. That's been absolutely fantastic too. Um, don't be misled at newspaper headlines which say, you know, massive staycation boost this year. Uh, visit, you know, bookings have gone through the roof. Very few people are taking bookings because they don't know when we're going to open. So don't be misled by that. There's a huge pent up desire. But what we don't have is the cash that goes along with it yet. OK, we'll come back to some of those points because I'm interested to pick up on some of those those very points really around virtual online experiences. Um, somebody's asking some questions about that about that in the chat room and also this this pent up demand and where, where that might lead to. Um, thanks for the moment, Bernard. Um, Without further ado, over to Dave. Um, and Dave, from a Manchester perspective, just give us an insight of the, the world from a, a cultural lens. Um, uh, thanks, Nick. I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to uh, start off with a bit of home and then uh, just as a, a, an illustration, then move into the wider sector. So, um, uh, and it's also really interesting that, that I didn't know what Kate and Bernard were going to say, but I absolutely agree with so much of what they were saying. So, uh, so, so thanks, thanks for that. I'll try not to duplicate it and see if I can edit as I'm going along. Um, so, um, home closed on the 17th of March um, after a year where I think we were confirmed as the most visited attraction in Greater Manchester in that year. We'd sort yeah. of um, uh, done really good business. Um, we've only been open 61 days since. Um, and uh, but we're, um, and, and under social distancing measures. And when we did that, we did really, really good business. Everything was selling out, even though it was limited capacity. Everything was selling out. We couldn't meet demand. Um, Homes operated by Greater Manchester Arts Centre Limited. It's a charity and we operate the building on behalf of Manchester City Council, who own the building. And they fund us to deliver across economic and social benefits for the city. That's what our um, uh, operating contract is for. Last year, I mentioned 900,000 visits. Uh, the GVA that's independently measured by economists, uh, we don't do it, we didn't make this figure up, 25 million. 
of that, they estimate that, that the visitors to home, uh, uh, the investment home, saved the NHS a million quid through health benefits from people taking part in what we were doing. Um, uh, I, how they calculated that, I have no idea. But anyway, that's what they say. Um, the, the GVA from visit to spend alone was £11.2 million. Pounds. Um, now, if you widen that across the whole of the greater Manchester sector, 130, sorry, the, the Manchester City Council, I should say, I'm Director of culture for, the, culture for the City of Manchester, not Greater Manchester. The cultural sector alone in the City of Manchester is worth 137 million GVA. And again, a large part of that will be on visitor spend. So you can imagine how much of that's been taken out of the economy and, and the huge recovery challenge that we face over the next 18 months to two years. Um, uh, and and the, the, the cultural sector's got a, a, a really uh, significant role to play in that. But we can't do it if we're not open. We are, we're all doing blended stuff, but we have to be open. And we've got a duty to do open as soon as we can, uh, uh, both safely um, uh, uh, and, and, and also um, you know, effectively uh, delivering good art. Um, we need to do that for the economy and for health. And it was great to hear uh, Bernard mention health because th this is going to be such a big thing for us going forward. Um, the health benefits of tourism m more broadly and actually in t using leisure activity are vital to the recovery of our society, um, let alone our economy. So there has been some help from the government. The 1.57 billion uh, cultural relief fund has been vital, um, uh, a, a vital lifeline, as has the VAT reduction for some organisations and, and the, the, the really vital support of uh, the combined authority, the city council, local authorities in Greater Manchester, Arts Council England, heritage organisations, etc. have been really important. But there's been a big chunk left out and that's the freelance ecology. And, and, and they're such an important part of our supply chain and, and, and they're one of the big worries we've got in the future. So there are a few challenges I want to highlight. Um, uh, we can see our high, high, high streets are, uh, are stressed and struggling. Um, uh, but what, what will people find when they come back? Is it going to be like the zombie apocalypse? You know, the tumbleweed running down the middle of the road. Culture has got to play a really important role in that. Um, businesses are going to really find it hard to persuade their, their, their employees to come back to their desks in towns and city centres when they've in, many of them have quite enjoyed working from home. There needs to be something else. The nighttime economy, the visitor economy is vital in getting the rest of business going, not just the tourism business, the rest of business. Um, but coming down the line, we've got an economic recession. Um, and, uh, and people are going to have less money. Local authorities and universities have got massive funding challenges and they underpin the funding of many of our tourist attractions. Um, uh, so, for example, the Whitworth Art Gallery or Home from a local authority point of view. Um, local authorities are staring down the barrel of huge cuts. Now, we're lucky at the moment that it looks like Manchester City Council and the Combined Authority are going to hang on to their cultural funding for the next 12 months, but we don't know whether that's going to continue beyond because um, they're challenged. International visitors are going to be hard to find because travel is challenged. Um, regional travelling uh, is, is challenged because the reduction in services, are, 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 etc., the changes. But, uh, and, and also, we know that public transport in the north isn't what it should be anyway because it's lacked investment over the time. We've got the mental health challenges. People are going to be, we know from our audience research, people are worried about getting into the same space as other people again at the same time as wanting to do it. Um, the, coming in and out of restrictions is a nightmare. We spent £60,000 getting COVID secure for 61 days. It's not a good use of public money. The decimation of our talent pipeline and supply chains, the decimation of our pr uh, product pipeline, it'll take time to restart. The, um, uh, the climate emergency hasn't gone away. And, and our audiences are hyper aware of this because they've spent the last 12 months on social media reading about it. Black Lives Matter, similarly, um, has shone a light on, 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 on the fact that there are huge inequalities and, uh, and, and black, uh, 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 black equality is just one of those. There's, there's also gender, gender identity, disability, class. All of those things our audiences are not going to accept anymore. And we need to, be, we need to really come out of the blocks with a new offer, as, as Bernard was rightly saying. So I'm going to talk briefly about what I think that um, we should be doing at an organisational level rather than a, a higher level, because I think Kate and Bernard have nailed that, actually. Um, I see the tourism and the cultural sector doing some of the following over the next 18 months and two years. First of all, getting open as soon as we can safely um, uh, um, uh, uh, and being really hard ass about COVID security. And um, the fact that we were gold standard in that 
um, uh, uh, meant that we, we weren't a cause for infection and we need to continue that and build confidence in our audiences. We need phased market approach targeting local audiences initially and then gradually building out from there. We need to breathe life back into our places. Um, no one wants to visit a zombie apocalypse landscape. So if our local people are using stuff, at least it looks like somebody's interested and we can start to make it more attractive. Focus on bridge and tunnel audiences, a bit of jargon from the, from the tourism industry there. Um, um, uh, that, that whole visiting fam uh, family and relatives, uh, uh, you know, build, build from local, build outwards. Um, um, a, a phased work on the work, a phased approach to the work that we make. We're going to have to work with locally and regionally based artists. No bad thing because they're not going to be travelling from all over the country and all over the world to work with us for the next eighteen months. We need to build up from the ground, and that's going to be good for the pa talent pipeline in the future. Um, we need, we need to build our programs around hope and joy and community that we all missed and, and really uh, make people feel welcome back. We want to be involved in co-creation and co-curation with our audiences so that they feel confident in what they're getting is what they're looking for. Really good audience uh, interaction there. Ble a blended model that delivers in venues and online will have to be part of the offer for the, for the the, the foreseeable future because of the, the possibility of coming in and out of tying down. Um, at, at lockdowns. Um, we need to work really hard on our price proposition and affordability and rebuild from the ground up. We need critical mass um, uh, because people aren't going to have loads of money. Um, we need building common cause with the NHS uh, around the benefits of culture for mental health, for physical health, um, uh, developing environmental sustainable, bu sustainable business practices uh, and being very upfront about that in our promotion because our audiences are really going to look for it and want to know that we're doing it. Partnerships across the whole of the north um, around uh, making sure that we get our fair share of the levelling up agenda, whatever that means. At the moment, I hear lots of talk about investment in innovation. I don't hear a great deal of investment in the uh, talk about the levelling up the visitor economy and, and, and our uh, transport infrastructure, all vital to that. Um, and finally, um, creating and presenting fantastic work that celebrates the, the wonderful diversity of our city region. That is going to be the biggest draw for everybody, making great work. Um, I think I've just about managed with time, but uh, hopefully that's it. Thanks, Dave. You, you're, you're bang on time, actually. 15.37 is exactly bang on time. So well done. Thank you very much. Um, quick question from, um, from the chat box from Sarah. Do we envisage cultural recovery round three, uh, fund round three? Is that being talked about for the cultural sector at the moment? It, um, I'm, I'm hearing rumours, but unsubstantiated. Um, Nick uh, Bernard's nodding. He must probably um, more plumbed into that than I am. Um, I, I am hearing um, uh, uh, stories about it, but I think that it, 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 what's clear is that we've got cultural recovery strategy, um, uh, uh, cultural recovery funding that, that is currently being applied for for April, May and June. Uh, and, and then a lot of rent holidays finish and all that sort of stuff finishes then. And all of a sudden, we've got a magic up full business to be able to pay for all those expenses. Well, there's another cliff edge at the end of June and and, un, uh, uh, and furlough finishes the end of April at the moment. So unless there's something comes in the back of that, even if it's tapered, um, uh, we will see some casualties because uh, uh, organisations won't be able to, carry, uh, to, to trade through that. You, can, you just don't turn on full trading instantly. We know that. So I hope there is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And Kate, that's that's certainly something that UK hospitality have been looking for is is this tapering off of the support measures that are in place at the moment, rather than the cessation of those at the end of April. Yes. I mean, I think you've you've got multiple cliff edges. So at the end of thirty first of March, you've got VAT comes to an end. I mean, VAT cuts are no benefit if you closed. Um, so so you know you just need to push that back. That the merits of having that for the recovery period are clear business rates uh, comes to an end and we go back to the the business rates set at our property prices set at 2015 the height of the property market there's no way we're going to be able to pay that rent protection comes to an end people are going to have to pay a year's worth of debt of rent debt in one go and then you've got 31st of april you've got furlough coming to an end this is a much longer term um, crisis and it's a much longer term recovery period that is needed. And we need to have that feathering so that as economic activity increases, and as I said before in my, my earlier presentation, it's going to take us longer to recover consumer confidence this time round than last time because consumers have had their plans disrupted too many times over the autumn where we were open, closed, tears, you know, moving multiple times. You were promised Christmas, you weren't promised Christmas. People are going to be reluctant to commit and book. 
So it's going to take time. So you need that that feathering of support. So the, the staycation boom from your perspective and from people you're talking to, is that something that's real or something that's media? Um, I, I, I think it's media, to be honest, at the moment. We can't take bookings. We don't know whether we're going to be open. You're not allowed to take bookings for the short term um, there is some residual business on the books and people are inquiring about summer but nobody's putting deposits down and nobody's backing it with cash so to me this is going around the car showroom and saying I'm really interested in going out for a test drive of the latest Jaguar that does not mean I've bought a Jaguar <laughs> You know, that that's where I think we are at. Um, and consumers are, are, are reluctant. I think there will be a lot of demand. Um, and I think that people are looking at it, but, but it, it's too soon to be able to book. And certainly for a lot of our businesses that are going to be hardest hit, and, I, you know, Manchester City Centre hotels are going to be one of those that are hardest hit. It's not your first choice when you're looking at replacing your summer break to Spain. You would tend to go to, to leisure. You tend to go to the coast. So, so no, we're not seeing it translating through into bookings and a business on the books. You would normally have an awful lot of that taking place and the bookings happening the first two weeks after Christmas. That's not happened. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, there was a question in the chat room about business visits and events and the sort of roadmap for opening those back up. Do, does anybody have a, a view on when that might happen or what, what, what needs to be in place? We've not had any announcement very recently on business visits and events at all. No, I mean, we did have before Christmas. I mean, that was the first time we'd, we'd seen that there was a, a move towards reopening bigger events, conferences, functions. And then within two weeks, it was closed down again. So, so we did have that date. These have a long lead time. If you're planning a major conference or event, you need to know now that you can book with confidence for the, for the autumn. So I think that the, the lo more we have uncertainty, the longer the lead time is for the recovery in that business. It doesn't pick up very quickly. I think people are going to be more discerning about the type of events they do uh, and therefore cities like Manchester are better placed to capitalise on the recovery because what, if you're going to spend a couple of days and you're going to commit to being in a face-to-face -face meeting at a business event, where would you rather go? Somewhere that's got the cultural life and the activity or, or somewhere that's a sort of, you know, uh, a, an airport hotel or a, a conference centre that's got no soul or, or is, is in the middle of the countryside. So, so I do think that there needs to be a plan, but, but hopefully we can have that restart uh, and start to rebuild, but it's going to need planning, as is city centre recovery. It is going to need planning. Manchester and London are not going to recover on their own, Birmingham too. Um, it's going to need a concerted action plan, and I do think you're going to need some kind of city's fund to be able to repair some of these businesses. If you look at the, the grants, they are totally inadequate for, for dispersal to, to a city where you've got um, a small proportion of residential and a large proportion of businesses that are severely affected. All of those city centres are going to be hollowed out if we're not careful and get support there. Thank you. And presumably, Dave, uh, it's the same for the cultural sector in terms of lead-in times for programming and, and planning in, in work. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that um, most of us think it's unlikely we'll be open before May for so, even for was it uh, level four protocols, which are socially distanced. Um, the, the likelihood is being able to move to level five protocols, which are people sitting next to each other in a space, possibly the autumn. Uh, some people are saying September, some people are saying November, as late as November. Um, uh, but also with the likelihood that, that, that there's a chance that we might get a, a short term local lockdown or changing tiers or whatever, depending on what happens with the vaccine. So there's a lot of uncertainty around. And, and, and the, the biggest problem is the capitalisation of things like theatre shows or exhibitions that you know that you, you you've got a big upfront expenditure before you can open the doors um is it, it mean, means that it you know that uncertainty needs to be steadied down everybody at the moment is looking towards what the chan uh, what um the prime minister is going to say on the 22nd of february and 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 are just holding back a little bit before we we move and uh, you know that there is some talk however um in a number of places about about outdoor venues and and outdoor work in um in may june july um uh, uh, in order to try and um find you know f find a foothold in, into as much as anything encouraging people to re-socialize with the public realm um yeah. in, in order to come out and, and and think about coming out if that's doable but the 22nd of february is going to be vital in that 
Okay. Um, I'm afraid we'll run out of time and I'm, I'm, I'm very bad at answering all the questions or asking all the questions that have come into the chat room. So for people that have asked questions and put them in the chat room, we'll, we'll take those offline and, and respond to those in the follow-up notes. Um, it, it remains for me to say thank you to each of our speakers. Thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon, Kate, Bernard, Dave. Um, thank you for, for, for your insights. Um, what's clear really is that um, we're, we're saying the same things in lots of different forums, which is good. Um, and that joined up approach that both Kate and, and, and Bernard mentioned is it seems to be working in terms of uh, getting the messages home to government. So um, that, that spirit of collaboration really is working in this time of crisis, really. But um, thanks to each of you for, for taking part this afternoon. And with that, I'll hand back to, um, I'm handing over to Victoria now, who's going to talk about um, the recovery plan for Manchester and um, so answering some of the questions that were in the chat room about um, how we're addressing the concerns of perceptions and consumer confidence. So Victoria, over to you. Hopefully. Victoria's there. Victoria, if you can hear me, we obviously can't hear you, so I can talk through your slides if you can move them. Great, <laughs> it works. So sorry about that, folks. Uh, we've got a great suite of recovery campaigns uh, to roll out. We've been trying to do that for the last, what, six or seven months, a uh, bit uh, stop and start. So many of you have, we all have seen some of these campaigns already. We started back way back in March with a virtual campaign and I noticed that some of the people in the Q&A were um, asking about virtual content. So if you have a look at Martin Manchester website, visit Manchester website, you'll see a, a great uh, plethora of cultural education um, content. So we started that just for a couple of months. We've now ended back up with that, um, the virtual campaign, just to keep things going and to keep uh, some awareness about Manchester there. Um, secondly, we had a suite of Find Your Space uh, campaigns. So Find Your Space was all about if you were on your own or in a group of six, whatever the, the tier was at the time, you could enjoy the outdoors or find your own space, uh, a bit about mental health and headspace too. Uh, we ran a super campaign um, with the universities, the three universities, to try to mitigate any of the um, students deferring their places last year, and that was really successful. And Space to Meet campaign is our campaign for the business visits and events sector. We haven't managed to launch that yet. So as soon as we get a roadmap for that, we'll be on it. The other two campaigns we've got on the wings um, are Have an Out on Us and This One's on Us. So this is all about accommodation and food and drink incentive campaigns to get uh, people back in when the time is right. And then finally, we're working with the bid, uh, with all of the retailers on a city centre campaign, and that's been going on and off. For Shona, I don't know if you can hear me now. My camera wasn't working. Can you that's hear me great. now? <laughs> Handing over to you, Victoria. Sorry Do about that. Talk? These things happen. Sorry, Lucy helped me out with some technical issues. Um, so just to take over from where Shona uh, left off. So um, we're working on a number of different campaigns. So just to reassure everybody that we've been we've been working on things that we can roll out as soon as we get the go ahead. So we've got quite a few tactical campaigns that we've got ready to go as soon as we're given the go ahead. So if we talk about the Have a Night on Us campaign, we started to work on this in September, um, ready to roll out during the 
autumn but obviously with the tier system we weren't able to get this one going however we've done a lot of the background work to enable us to get this one ready for rollout as soon as we begin to uh, move down the tier system again so this is basically looking at targeting people from within about a three hour drive time and giving them extra added value by giving them an extra night in manchester so for instance if they book two nights they get a night free and this will be powered by um, TXGB which is Visit Britain's um, bookable system um, so this this will help us to be able to send out tactical offers we just heard Dave talking about how we actually incentivize people to come out of their house and actually start to re-engage with le leisure activities so this will be the um, short breaks element of what we want to do and then if we look at another tactical offer that this one's on us campaign is to add value to the um, the short breaks messaging and also to engage with those crucial local audiences that will engage in the uh, visitor economy hospitality by adding added value that they can actually um, get something additional so tactical offers in the short term that we can help to to drive footfall back into the city centre and um, so we don't know when we'll be be going live with this activity but we're, we're hoping optimistically if we might be able to get out of the door in March but back to Kate's, Kate's point it's more likely that we might be able to do something around the Easter weekend so as soon as we we can go we'll be good to go with both of those offer-led campaigns and um, I also wanted to talk to you about some of our business campaigns because we know how crucial engaging the visitor economy and driving business back in but also making sure that we're also engaging the business um, side of, of the economy to make sure that we're making the most opportunity about re-engaging with corporate travellers and getting corporate business in. So I wanted to also tell you about some of the work that we're doing at Marketing Manchester with our partners mind as to, um, to look at delivering sector activity. So we'll be promoting um, Manchester and Greater Manchester for our digital credentials, our innovation, our green credentials and also internationally for business relocations. So again, making sure that we're feeding all of those business messages out to make sure that the ecosystem is being brought back to life. And then we, we talked earlier about return to the office and we know that this is going to be really challenging because people are, are quite happy to be working in, at, from home from a lot of instances and businesses have proved the model. So we want to be delivering campaign activity that helps to get workers back into the city centre and our regional town centres to make sure that they, they are driving the economy. We know that we need the footfall from commuters and also we, we need to make sure that they're taking advantage of the visitor economy during their breaks and before and after work. So with this campaign, we want to make sure that we're supporting employers to get their workforce back into, into their offices and also to promote the benefits of the workplace and not just coming to work. It's all of those things that you do around work. It's collaboration, it's visiting the art gallery at lunchtime, it's catching a movie afterwards. So we want to make sure that we're driving footfall firmly with health and well-being at the heart of what we're doing, making sure that people are confident to start, first of all, travelling back into city centres and then also beginning to enjoy leisure activities. And then uh, the final slide is an overview, really. It's a bit of a guessing game at the moment as to when we'll be able to deliver this activity. But we've been looking at how we can roll out our campaigns and, and at which point we can actually do that. So our Manchester Misses You campaign is the one that's live at the moment and will run throughout lockdown. We had two million visits engaging with our digital content. Um, during the first lockdown and already in January we've had 200,000 visitors engaging with that content that will continue and then as we work our way down the tier system we'll be able to do more and more around visits um, and, and meetings and then the sector campaigns with business being live throughout this period will continue to deliver that throughout. So I hope that gives you a brief overview and, and helps to reassure you that when we when we can go, Marketing Manchester are ready to go and we'll be driving this activity out on your behalf. Any questions from anybody? Oh, 
That's great. Thanks, Victoria. I, th I think there's quite a few questions in the uh, chat box. But I think uh, Victoria's just demonstrated that we, Marketing Manchester, we are ready. We're ready for whatever happens in terms of lock, coming out of lockdown and going through the tiers uh, back into recovery. Um, and I just wanted to reflect on that um, and also on the key messages that have come out from our speakers today in terms of the strong messages uh, that are echoed across everyone who's talked in the last uh, 50 minutes about the recovery and the strong messages that we should be putting back to government. Uh, one is uh, to back tourism and hospitality as a sector because it's a progressive sector and it will accelerate the UK's recovery. Two, we must help repair the negative perceptions, particularly in those international markets, the key markets that currently hold the UK in not a very good light because of the COVID situation. And three, we need a clear exit strategy. And I particularly like the idea of a cities fund that Kate mentioned before. I think there's three really strong messages. If we can all take that back and lobby uh, and into our government and pol political networks, that would that would really help, particularly before the, the, the budget. Um, so it just brings to me to say thank you very much again to all our speakers. Um, thank you again for you for attending and for your support throughout last year and uh, continued support going forward. Um, and I'd just like, if you could, please, there's a poll, um, there's a couple of questions in the poll, just to give us some feedback. Only two questions, I'll take you just a couple of minutes. And really to say um, the next event coming up is next week. It's the Investment Summit uh, on the 2nd of February. And if you can attend that, we'll pop some details in um, to follow up here, it is here. It's the London Real Estate Forum. It's uh, called People, Place, Prosperity. And it's next uh, Tuesday at two o'clock. So please uh, tune in for that. And it just remains to say then, thank you again for your continued support. Looking forward to work with you on this great recovery. And I'm confident that we can survive the great rhinoceros, as Kate said, to build back uh, to a growth sector again. So thanks again for joining us. And uh, please take care and stay safe. Thank you.